Is it to be a self? Can you hear me in the back? No? Is it better? Okay. What is it to be a self? How can we come to understand ourselves? And how should we relate to ourselves? We all have a sense of ourselves. I know that I'm me and not you. And I think that I have at least a vague sense of who I am, what my character is like, how I tend to feel and think about things, what I like and what I don't like, what I've done and what I hope to do. We also have at least a vague sense of what a good form of selfhood is. But we should be clear, when we say a good form of selfhood, we don't mean those traits that make a person good, like holding the right beliefs, feeling the right things. Uh, for instance, we think good people should feel horror and disgust at the suffering of innocent children, and that's important. But that's a different thing than being good at selfhood. Um, other examples of, of being a good person are liking the right movies and books, and music, holding worthwhile aims and goals, and that's not what we're talking about here today. Instead, when we ask what a good form of selfhood is, we mean what makes you good at being yourself. Being a good self means something like being you, being true to yourself, and uh, following many other philosophers, we'll refer to this as authenticity. But before we get to that, a lot of philosophers are skeptics about the self. They argue that the sense that you have of being a self is an illusion. There actually is no you, no true self. The Scottish philosopher David Hume is perhaps the most famous self-skeptic. Hume wrote, there are some who imagine we are every moment intimately conscious of what we call ourself, that we feel its existence and its continuance in existence, and are certain beyond the evidence of a demonstration both of its perfect identity and simplicity but if any impression gives rise to the idea of self, that impression must continue invariably the same through the whole course of our lives, since self is supposed to exist after that manner. But there is no impression constant and invariable. If anyone upon serious and unprejudiced reflection thinks he has a different notion of himself, I must confess I can reason no longer with him. He may perhaps perceive something simple and continued, which he calls himself, though I am certain there is no such principle in me. So Hume, in other words, argues that uh, first, if there is a self, we should be able to, to discover the self through introspection. That is, we should be able to find an impression of the self in our experience. And second, if there is a self, the self should be constant, invariable, and have perfect identity with itself. That is, it should be some solid, unchanging thing. But, Hume argues, when we introspect, we find no constant and invariable impression. So, uh, elaborating on this third premise, Hume says, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never can catch myself at any time without a perception and never can observe anything but the perception. So um, that my impressions or experiences are constantly changing and there is nothing in my consciousness beside these constantly changing perceptions is what Hume thinks when we, introspect, we find when we introspect. And so that leads him to conclude that there is no self. Now, we agree with Hume uh, that we can have no direct experience of ourselves through introspection. But we also think that Hume was looking for the wrong thing. You could call his conception of the self the thing-like conception. He thinks that the self is supposed to exist invariably as the same constant and unchanging like a thing. And if the self is supposed to be thing-like, then being a good self will amount to being sincere, to just thinking what you think wanting what you want, and saying what you mean. Thank you. But there is another conception of the self, um, which is as far as possible from Hume's thing-like conception. And we'll call this the fluid conception of the self. The 20th century French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, mused that, and here's the quote, if I could even conceive of a liquefaction of myself, that is, of my being's transformation into water, I would not be unduly affected by it. 
because water is the symbol of consciousness, its movement, its fluidity, that non-solid interdependence of its being, its perpetual flight, etc. The fluid view of the self, it turns out, um, is a very old one. Two and a half thousand years ago, for instance, the philosopher Heraclitus said that souls evaporate from moist things. For Heraclitus, the soul was the rational part um, of ourself. Even water was too dense and thing-like to sustain the free fluidity of the reasoning part of the self. And that's why Heraclitus thinks that our souls are like the mist that evaporates from water. And when we make our souls too wet with alcohol, we lose our capacity to reason. Thus, Heraclitus held that, and here's another quote, for souls it is death to become water, for water it is death to become earth, but out of earth water comes to be, and out of water, soul. On the fluid conception of the selves, the self is not at all stable, solid, and unchanging. It is, as Sartre says, necessarily in perpetual flight, constantly changing and even incapable of stasis. On this conception, becoming thick and thing-like, sincere and unchanging, would be the death of the self. But how could we ever understand ourselves if we were in perpetual motion? What does it even mean to be authentically yourself if what you are is constantly changing? And what reason is there to believe that we are fluid selves? And this is part one of our talk, there's two parts, uh, and part one is the Sartre himself. So let's start by painting a picture of what it might mean to be a fluid self. This is the picture of selfhood that one finds in the work of Sartre. It has important overlaps with the picture of selfhood that one finds in other 20th century philosophers, so for instance, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and Martin Heidegger. Uh, but we're going to focus on Sartre today. Uh, we'll present this view of the self in the form of five theses about selfhood. And as we're presenting these, we want you to ask yourself whether each of these is an accurate description of what you experience in being yourself. Sartre refers to the self as the for itself, uh, because to be a self is to relate to myself, to understand on some level that every time I act, I'm expressing and taking a stand on who I am, the character of my existence that's stake in everything I do. So the first thesis about the self, or the for itself, is what we call Sartre's paradox. Uh, Sartre uh, holds that a human being, A, is what it is not, and B, is not what it is. And incidentally, Heraclitus has a very similar version of the same paradox. He says, um, we step and we do not step into the same rivers, we are and we are not. Now, why can't we step into the same river twice? Well, it's because the river is never the same. It's constantly moving from one moment to the next. Um, while we give it the same name, it's not the same water. The water is constantly rushing on and past us. But as the second part of this quote shows, we're the same as the river. We also are not the same from one moment to the next. Like the river, we are and are not the same person. But that's a, a profound paradox. How can we understand the idea that we both are and are not? In saying, I am what I'm not, Sartre points out, we're using the verb to be in two different ways. So when I say things like, the table is round or the roof is sagging, uh, I'm, I'm impressed that it's still holding up after <laughs> years. Uh, the word is means that right now the roof actually and fully possesses the property of sagging. And we'll call this the objective use of the verb to be. So when you use it objectively to say X is Y, it means X currently possesses the property Y. But when I say something like Eric is funny, or I am a philosopher, the word is does not mean that right now, oops, where am I? Uh, sorry. There. It doesn't mean that right now Eric actually fully possesses the property of being funny. Why not? Well, he might be asleep, or uh, he might be talking about a very serious matter. Uh, he's still funny, not because he always possesses the property of funniness in the way that the roof possesses the property of sagging. Similarly, I can be a philosopher even when I'm not doing philosophy. And even when I am doing philosophy, there's always more to being a philosopher 
than I'm doing at any given moment. So being a philosopher is not an objective property that someone could ever fully possess. There's more to every person than there being a philosopher or being funny or filling any other social role or holding any other character traits. So when we use the verb to be in saying I'm a philosopher, Sartre calls this the internal use of the verb. So X is Y internally means that Y defines the meaning of X, even if X does not currently possess the property Y. So it's internal because it's getting at one part of who a person really is. Now, Sartre points out that there's a very easy way to see the difference between the objective use of the verb to be and the internal use. I can be defined by properties I don't objectively possess. For instance, Sartre gives the example, and for him it was a very personal example, of someone whose entire character is shaped by the melancholic recognition that he is not beautiful. Beauty is not an objective property that he possesses, and yet the way that he relates to other people is profoundly shaped by his not being beautiful. Uh, the reverse is also true, so I can um, objectively possess properties which do not define me. So for example, someone could be German in the objective sense, um, she was born in Germany to German parents, possesses German citizenship, has a German accent, even though I like to think of it as more generically European. <laughs> um, but she experiences situations in an Italian rather than a German style. So when Sasa says that a human being is what it is not, um, he means that human beings are always defined by properties that they don't objectively possess. For one thing, we humans are determined by our future aims and ambitions. Um, even when, or especially when, uh, we do not instantiate the condition to which we aspire. Students, for example, um, are determined by the property of being a graduate, a property they don't instantiate yet. <laughs> um, and as Sartre puts it, I am already what I will be, otherwise I would have no interest in being any particular way. I am the one who I will be in the mode of not being he. And when Sartre says that a human being is not what it is, he means that humans are never fully defined by the objective properties they possess. We humans have the ability to, to refuse to be defined by our objective properties, or Sartre calls these objective properties by our facticity. We also have the power to define ourselves through properties we do not objectively possess. And this ability Sartre calls um, our transcendence. And he insists that a transcendent being like us, and that's a quote, um, chooses itself as the surpassing here of the given. Um, that means it is defined by the specific ways that it surpasses the properties it currently possesses. So we can now express the difference between the thing-like conception of selfhood we saw at the start um, and the fluid conception of selfhood um, in the following way. The thing-like conception treats the self as if it were something objective and fully present at each and every moment. The fluid conception treats the self as something that is constantly transcending, overflowing the boundaries of any attempt to reduce it to a thing. So our second important thesis about selfhood is what we call the circuit of ipseity thesis. Uh, ipseity just means selfhood or personal identity. My, my ipseity is what is distinctive of me as an individual, and it comes from the Latin word ipse, which means self. So the circuit of ipseity is just a fancy way of saying that each self is defined by the interplay between a person's projects and the solicitations of their environment. In calling it a circuit, Sartre points to a circular recurring interaction between us and our environment. For, for example, suppose I'm hungry. My project at this moment is eat something. As a result of this project, I walk into a buffet restaurant. Imagine there's a long table set with all kinds of foods, steak, salad, tacos, sushi, stir-fried rice, apples, chocolate, cakes, etc. And now I find myself drawn to the tacos. Of all the foods on the table, the tacos stand out to me as by far the most appealing and appetizing. Does that mean that tacos are objectively more delicious than any other food on the table? Well, obviously not. They, they show up as appealing because I like tacos. But of course, I don't experience the deliciousness of the tacos as something I make up. I can't will myself to think 
that broccoli is delicious. And I don't even have to form a distinct decision to eat the tacos. Instead, they just show up as, as delicious and I feel drawn to them. I'm solicited to eat them because they really are delicious. So deliciousness appears to be a property they possess independently of me. Even though when I eat the tacos, I'm actually learning something about myself. So this means that I discover who I am not through introspection, as Hume thought we should, but by looking outward and seeing how the world draws me into action. The circuit of Ipsady thesis says, who I am is a function of the way some things attract me and others repel me. And this gives us then another point of contrast with the thing-like conception. Uh, the thing-like conception says that the self is contained in itself. It is independent of anything else in the world. Philosophers call this a subject. But the fluid conception sees the boundaries of the self as overflowing the interior or the subjective. What I am is a constant, ever-changing interplay with the world, so that who I am is revealed by the way the world draws me to act. Okay, we're on to the third thesis, which uh, we'll call the ambiguity thesis and it says that every human world interaction is profoundly ambiguous and can be plausibly interpreted in multiple different ways because it is the joint product of facticity and transcendence. Um, now, ambiguity can mean a proposition that has more than one definite meaning, so we might have to sort out which meaning is intended, uh, but once we do, there's no doubt about what it actually means. Um, take, for example, the sentence, Jane opened the gate and Pete saw her duck. It could mean that Jane owns a bird, a duck, and Pete saw it when she opened the gate. Or it could mean that Jane ducked, as in she bent down, when she opened the gate. This kind of ambiguity is quite superficial, um, in the sense that there is some fact of the matter uh, about which um, of the two meanings was intended. And once we know what kind of duck we are talking about, the uncertainty about the meaning disappears. Um, but that's not the kind of ambiguity we're talking about here. <laughs> uh, there's another kind of ambiguity, where there is no right, definite meaning. We call this a profound ambiguity. And in such a case, it is wrong to try to resolve the ambiguity by insisting on one definite interpretation. Take, for example, the, the situation of two people on a date. Um, call them Dora and Steve. Imagine that Dora knows that Steve is a serial seducer. And while she's not uninterested in him sexually, she doesn't want to be just the next in a long line of conquests. Dora wants Steve to be attracted to her for her intellect and her personality as well as sexually. Now suppose that Dora sits down in the restaurant and she adjusts her skirt. What is the meaning of the simple act? Is she trying to draw Steve's attention to her legs? Is she afraid that she's showing too much skin and trying to cover up? Or maybe the fabric was uncomfortably folded under her leg and she's straightening it? Or some combination of the above. Perhaps she first becomes conscious that the fabric is folded under her leg because she wants to draw Steve's attention to her legs. Sartre thinks that all interesting human situations are ambiguous in this way. Dora's action has several different meanings at once. And he says, the situation, a joint project of the contingency of brute facts and of freedom, is an ambiguous phenomenon within which it is impossible for a conscious human being to discern the contributions of freedom and the brute facts. And in other words, that just means that um, every situation of action is made up of facts that are not up to us to wish away, combined with reactions and intentions that transcend and define the meaning of those acts. And it's impossible to get completely clear about how to allocate responsibility for what happens. So in, in thinking about one of the primary sources of ambiguity, we come to the fourth thesis, the alienation thesis, which says that my objective character is defined by others. Uh, that's because I can't be an object to myself. So I'm constantly at risk of alienation from myself. The idea here is that there are many aspects of who we are that depend on the way other people respond to them. Sorry, Eric, but to take the example again of Eric being funny, whether Eric is funny or not is not something he has the power to decide for himself. Whether he's funny or not depends entirely on how the rest of us react to him. And the same goes for being graceful or clumsy, charming or boorish, 
sexy or unattractive and so on. There are intimate aspects of who I am that I'm simply not in a position to perceive without some mediation through others. Just like I can't see the back of my head directly. I can only see it in, in reflection in a mirror. In the same way, there are aspects of my character that I can only discover as they're reflected back to me through the way other people react to me. In being looked at by other people, Sartre argues, I experience my transcendence being transcended because they have the power to define the meaning or redefine the meaning of what I do and who I am. Of course, we aren't just looked at by others. We can also look back at them, objectifying them, and taking from them the power to define themselves. In fact, our relations to other people could be characterized as a constant interplay between looking and being looked at, between alienating others and experiencing alienation at their hands. This dynamic is captured brilliantly in Diego Velasquez's The Toilet of Venus. The viewer here looks at the goddess Venus from behind, again indicating that we're in a position to discover character traits of Venus that she cannot see herself. She might be the goddess of sexual desire, but it's we who decide whether she's sexy or not. In the painting, she reclines on a bed, naked, looking at a mirror being held by Cupid. The Venus's face is reflected in the mirror, and many viewers believe that she's examining her own reflection. But in fact, according to the law of optics, she necessarily can't be looking at her own reflection. We know this because we can see her face looking head on in the mirror, which means that she necessarily must be looking at us through the mirror. The scholars, by the way, have dubbed this illusion, the illusion that a person can see themselves in a mirror when, when, uh, when we see them in the mirror. They, they call that the Venus effect after paintings like this. Uh, if you don't believe me, get a friend and try it. Right? So, get, so get a mirror reflection of your friend looking at you and they'll realize they can't see themselves in the mirror at that moment. So as we stand in front of this painting, uh, we find ourselves caught up in the interplay of alienating looks. We gaze at the nude body of the goddess of love while she seems to be preoccupied and is contemplating something. Cupid is looking down, averting his eyes. So you might think that you're free to gaze at her voyeuristically, treating her as an object for pleasure or curiosity and uh, making judgment about the desirability of her body. But then we see her face in the mirror and realize, perhaps with a start, that she has in fact been watching us the whole time. As she watches us watching her, she can learn something about herself from the way we respond to her. But at the same time, she's passing judgment on us, objectifying us as perhaps lustful or voyeuristic or prudish. In this experience of being looked at by her, we see that her consciousness exceeds our gaze that there's a part of who she is that's fluid that overflows the categories we use to define her, that in fact she's not wholly defined by the gaze of others or by the objective characteristics she possesses. So we can sum up the differences between the thing-like conception of the self and the fluid self in this way. On the thing-like conception, the self is objective and fully present. On the fluid self, the self transcends the boundaries of its objective and present properties. On the thing-like conception, the self is self-contained. It's a subject. It is what it is independently of its surroundings. According to the circuit of Ipsaity thesis, the self is defined in dialogue with the world. Third, on the thing-like conception, the meaning of who I am and what I do can and should be determinate. On the fluid self uh, picture, the meaning of who I am and what I do is profoundly ambiguous. It can't be made fully determinate. And then finally, on the thing-like conception, I'm defined by the properties I possess, whereas on the fluid self picture, I'm always partially defined by other people. One consequence of the fluid self is that it is prone to what Sartre calls disintegration. Indeed, he defines the fluid self as, and that's a quote, a perpetually disintegrating synthesis. This talk of disintegration does not mean the destruction of the self, rather it is a dis integration, a resistance to integration, a tendency within the elements to pull apart, um, to lose their sync. Things are prone to disintegration when their aspects or parts necessarily belong together, but necessarily cannot be determined simultaneously or brought into view all at once. We've already seen this at work 
we have objective things like qualities, and these limit us and partially define um, who we are. But as fluid cells, we also have the power to pull away from our objective nature, to transcend and redefine ourselves. We are subject to the gaze and definition of others, and the way others respond to us also limits and defines us. We may struggle to integrate their view on us with our own, but we also find ourselves constantly rejecting the evaluations of others. And to help imagine this disintegrating fluid self, consider Francis Bacon's portrait um, of George Dyer in a mirror. Bring it, make it a bit, bit bigger. Um, the painting depicts George Dyer holding a cigarette in his left hand, seated in a chair. George's head is turned away from the viewer, looking towards a mirror that is situated behind him and to his right. So George presents to the viewer his left ear and the back of his head, features which look fixed, normally proportioned. At first glance, George appears to be sitting cross-legged, um, his right leg crossed over his left. But upon closer ex inspection, we can actually see um, from the sole of his shoe that it is the left foot and not his right foot that is extended toward the viewer. In fact, a white line starting just below George's left ear runs down his body to his left leg, in a sense dividing him into two. Yeah, no, but you can't see it very easily. So, it's here. Yeah. So, the screen's a little bit bright. Um, the two sides of George's body don't seem to match up, as if each side of his body was painted in a different position and or at a different moment. His right foot is a blur, and starting from his right knee, a white blob of paint um, trails off like the tail of a comet. The effect is to present him as if he were in motion, contorted, a non-harmonious composite of different moments in his existence. Meanwhile, the face in the mirror is presented in profile. And here again, we encounter a violation of the laws of, opt uh, of optics. If he is looking at the mirror, we should see him reflected back head on rather than in profile, unless uh, the reflection in the mirror presents a different moment in fact, maybe just like a second or two uh, before he started turning his head towards the mirror. You can see it a little bit more closely. Uh, George's head is coming apart in the mirror, as if the front part of his face, his eyes and his power to see, his mouth and his power to speak, is fleeing from the back of his body, the part of the body that he can't see or define for himself. The face is elongated in movement, pulling away from the fixed backside. So one might, might say that his face is striving to be, to be free, to free itself from the objective body to which it is bound. Bacon has captured, in other words, a disintegrating self. George Dyer is fluid in motion, making plans for what's ahead in the very moment he is tearing his, himself free of what's behind. This can maybe help us to imagine more clearly what it is like to have objective properties that limit and define us, even while we transcend them. To experience this integration is to choose our projects freely for ourselves, and in the very moment that we choose them, to discover that the world limits and redefines them. The world dictates and constrains the options available to me on the basis of the choice that I made. The meaning of my choices is also in part determined by others. Being a self means never being fully in control of the meaning of our actions. So to say that the self is fluid means uh, that I am always a work in progress always underway toward becoming the person that I am. Uh, but who I am emerges from an ongoing interaction between me and my world, between my projects and the reality in which I struggle to realize my goals. Okay, so part two, imagining the fluid self and its death. One way in which the fluidity of, fluidity of the self is revealed to us, Sartre argues, is through our reactions to certain substances. We've already seen in the circuit of Ipsaity that the world is endowed with significance through our projects, and it follows that an examination of qualities and objects and the reactions they elicit from us can reveal something about ourselves and about being in general. And thus, Sartre thinks it should be possible to perform what he calls a psychoanalysis of things. A uh, psychoanalysis of things, he explains, is concerned above all to establish the way in which each thing is the objective symbol of being and human reality's relation to this being. 
So recall, for example, the quote we read earlier, if I could even conceive of a little faction of myself, that is, of my being's transformation into water, I would not be unduly affected by it, because water is the symbol of consciousness. It's movement, it's fluidity, the non-solid interdependence of the being, the perpetual flight, and so on. So because consciousness is fluid, we don't experience any particular anxiety in imagining ourselves as liquid beings. Uh, but compare the delight we experience at flowing water moving over rocks, or waves crashing onto the shore, to our reaction to things that are slimy or viscous. Sartre claims that the connection we implicitly draw between the qualities of things in the objective world and the corresponding state of our consciousness explains why slime typically elicits disgust and even fear from us, and why we often associate sliminess with unpleasant character traits. Is Sartre correct about this psychoanalysis of things? We do, after all, often say things like, I don't like him, he's a bit slimy. And slimy substances are a common trope in horror literature and films. For example, uh, the, the birth scene in the, uh, in the Alien, uh, I think that's a little bit later from the birth scene there. Or think of the moment Neo wakes up in the Matrix for the first time, or uh, the secretions left behind by the shadow monsters in Stranger Things. Uh, given the circuit of obsidian, the way things get their significance from our projecting ourselves onto the world, there must, because of that, there must be something about our most basic aims that explains why the slimy is repulsive. The reason why slime disgusts us, Sartre argues, is that it reveals the possibility of a certain mode of being, an upsetting relation between the for itself consciousness and the universe of objects. If the activity of consciousness or being for itself has the fluidity of water, if consciousness is the sea within, a restless stream flowing over one object after another, while always remaining distinct from them, then it's not surprising that we experience a delight in flowing in water. So we had some technical issues earlier, so I left for a second. Um, but how might a psychology of things explain our reactions to slime? At first, Sato suggests, slime might exert a certain fascination on us, because it seems to symbolize a mode of being that is both fluid and fixed. The slimy appears to us to be a stable liquid, a substance that somehow manages to combine the solidity of objects and the fluidity of water. Such a substance would symbolize the possibility, and that's a quote from Sartre, a fusion of the for itself as pure temporality with the inner self as pure eternity. And that just means uh, the possibility of a being that is both conscious but also fixed like an object. But of course that's impossible. It's impossible to be both fluid and fixed. According to Sartre, this impossible being that is both fluid and thing-like is what we all secretly want. <laughs> So we all aim at, uh, but of course in vain, um, because as we have already seen, human beings are always what they are not, and they are not what they are. But um, Sartre goes on to tell us that slime is actually an enemy in disguise. It might appear to represent what we yearn for, the ultimate value of being both for ourselves, so free to choose and plan, and in ourselves, fully determined by the properties that we choose. But if we look a bit closer, we find that the slime is actually not both liquid and solid. It doesn't keep the fluidity of water, it doesn't retain it. Uh, but instead, the slime is a substance between two states, and that's a quote from Sartre. So like the salt and sea, the slime is water in the throes of death. So if not the impossible thing like fluid, what mode of being does the slime really symbolize? And here we should know that for Sartre, a consciousness is an intentional activity that gives order and meaning to objects. Um, as he puts it, consciousness has supremacy over objects. Um, so for example, when I'm conscious of a table, I separate the table out from its surroundings and thereby found its existence. Without this conscious act of individuating an object, the object doesn't really exist as a meaningful thing. So we might say that the literal grasping and taking hold of objects with our hands symbolizes the way in which consciousness grasps and takes hold of the world. Sandy, we've got Neo waking up in the Matrix. 
<laughs> but the reverse seems impossible. The table cannot touch me. It cannot found me or give me meaning because it is not conscious. Or so it seems to us until we touch something slimy. What happens when we try to let go of something slimy? Any idea? Yeah, exactly, it sticks to us. When we try to grasp slime, Sartre says, we experience a profound anxiety because it feels like slime is grasping us. <laughs> so the slimy stands for a consciousness that is grasped by objects rather than the other way around. It is, as Sartre puts it, a revenge of the objective world on the flu itself. And he, um, here's a quote, we can see the symbol that is abruptly disclosed here. Some forms of possession are malignant. It is possible for the in itself to absorb the for itself. That is for a being that is the opposite of the in itself for itself to be constituted in which the in itself would draw the for itself into its contingency, its indifferent externality, its unfounded existence. So our reaction to slime might not directly show us that our ultimate aim is to be a fluid self, as we initially, uh, a fluid object, as we initially suspected. But it shows us that we are afraid of no longer be, being a fluid self. The slimy represents what Sato calls an anti-value, a half merging of consciousness with objects. Slime symbolizes a consciousness that is losing its grasp on the world and that can no longer perform its structuring and meaning-giving activity, and yet remains distinct at the same time from the unconscious being of things. Um, and that's this state um, of slimy consciousness is something that Sartre um, explores in his novel Nausea. Um, and the following famous, famous scene is probably the best example of what it would mean to have a slimy consciousness. So here's an excerpt from Nausea. I was in the mu mu uh, municipal park just now. Sorry. <laughs> the root of the chestnut tree plunged into the ground just underneath my bench. I no longer remembered that it was a root. Words had disappeared, and with them the meaning of things, the methods of using them, the feeble landmarks which men have traced on their surface. The roots, the park gates, the bench, the sparse grass on the lawn, all that had vanished. The diversity of things, their individuality, was only an appearance, a veneer. This veneer had melted, leaving soft, monstrous masses in disorder, naked with a frightening nakedness. So um, can we conclude then that our primal revulsion to slime is a manifestation of our preference for fluidity and thus provides evidence in support of the fluid conception of the self? Well, perhaps, but there are reasons to worry about this conclusion. After all, we're not always repelled by slimy things. An example of which uh, Sartre is very much aware is the delightfully slimy aspects of sexual desire. Sartre himself wrote, quote, we know that in sexual desire, conscious seem, consciousness seems to become thicker, that we feel as if we're allowing ourselves to be invaded by facticity, and that our weighed down consciousness swoons and slides into a state of languor comparable to sleep, end quote. Succumbing to sexual desire is thus a form of consciousness in the throes of death for Sartre the self becoming thicker as it surrenders to the flesh. So it's perhaps no surprise that Sartre personally regards sexual arousal as terrifying, as a, quote, phenomenon whose autonomous and involuntary expansion accompanies and signifies the movement through which consciousness becomes bogged down within the body, end quote. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir, pictured here with Sartre, Sartre's lifelong partner, said that sex with Sartre could be exhausting because he could never let himself go and become incarnated in his body. What then are we to make of those among us, there may be a few here, who feel no particular revulsion at the way sexual desire slimes our consciousness? Are they a counter argument to Sartre's fluid conception of the self? And we think not necessarily. It could be the case that certain kinds of slimy activity attract us precisely because they're temporary. For a while, we can lose ourselves, surrender responsibility for ourselves, knowing that the slime will become liquid again, not water in the throes of death, but consciousness coming to grips with its embodiment and discovering the limits of its freedom. 
such slimy moments might also allow us a brief reprieve from the restless activity of pursuing our projects. The sea of consciousness slows down, does not quite come to a halt, but manages to pause for a moment to catch its breath. That's it. <laughs>